In an unmarked grave in the otherwise remarkable Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati, Ohio, lies the remains of a man who was possibly the only witness to be watching Abraham Lincoln at the moment he was shot. His name was James Patton Ferguson. And almost all we know of his life before he came to Washington seems to come from an 1878 Chillicothe, Ohio newspaper article, which should possibly be taken with a grain of salt, as it seems likely that Ferguson himself was the main source of the information given. We do know that Ferguson was born in Highland County, Ohio in 1828. According to the 1878 article, Ferguson worked on steamboats on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers and at one point tried his hand at being a policeman in Cincinnati before being fired for sleeping in a barrel while on duty. The article also relates that in 1855 or 1856, Ferguson joined a group of mercenaries under the command of Tennessee doctor and lawyer William Walker, who wanted to conquer parts of Central America and turn them into slave-holding colonies. Walker's army temporarily conquered Nicaragua along with the help of local rebels, but was driven out when Costa Rica joined the fight. Ferguson was wounded in the fighting, but made it back to the States, now with a permanent limp as a result of his wound. By the time of the American Civil War, Ferguson was living in Washington, D.C. He and his wife Martha became friends with the Cecil family, and when Mr. Cecil died in 1862, the Fergusons took in the Cecil's middle daughter, Mary Ella, known as Ella to family and friends. In this article from the Washington Evening Star on October 4, 1864, we see an entry under military draft exemptions for James P. Ferguson due to physical disability. Presumably this is the same man, and the disability refers to his limp. By April 1865, Ferguson owned and operated the Greenback Saloon on 10th Street right next door to Ford's Theater. Over time, Ferguson had come to know many of the crew and actors of Ford's, including John Wilkes Booth. Some of them were secessionists and would have run-ins with Ferguson, who was decidedly pro-union. It's curious that Ferguson's saloon was on the north side of Ford's Theater, and the Star Saloon which was more Confederate-friendly, was on the south side. On Good Friday, April 14, 1865, Ferguson was alerted by Ford's theater manager Harry Ford that the President and General Grant, along with their wives, were expected to attend the theater that night. Being a fan of General Grant, Ferguson purchased tickets for seats 58 and 59 on the theater's lower balcony level, commonly called the Dress Circle. The seats were directly across from the presidential box so that Ferguson could get a good view of the presidential party and, as it turned out, a view of John Wilkes Booth as he entered the presidential box. For whatever reason, Martha Ferguson did not attend, so it was Ella, 14 going on 15 years old, who accompanied Ferguson to Ford's that night. When the president arrived, Ferguson saw that General Grant was not with him, but still held out hope that the general might come later. The following is a composite account drawn from various statements that Ferguson made after the assassination in the several weeks following. Ferguson said that during Act 3 of the play, he saw John Wilkes Booth standing on the dress circle near the presidential box for a short time before going through the door to the box itself. 
Ferguson then began watching the presidential party, which consisted of the president and first lady, Major Henry Rathbone, and his fiancée, Miss Clara Harris. Ferguson later said that the president had one hand on the railing in front of him, and with the other was holding a hanging flag aside so that he could look down at the audience when the shot was fired. He saw a flash and smoke from the gun, and saw the president's right arm thrown upward and Mrs. Lincoln catch him around the neck. He then saw Booth pull a knife out and move between Mrs. Lincoln and Miss Harris, undoubtedly to attack Major Rathbone. Then Booth rushed to the front of the box and started to climb over. Booth seemed to momentarily be held back, which would correspond with Major Rathbone's statement that he caught hold of Booth's coat temporarily. Ferguson saw Booth strike backward with the knife and then finish climbing over and drop to the stage. He saw Booth's right spur catch on the blue part of the flag draped across the railing of the box. The spur tore off a piece of the flag which remained on Booth's spur when he landed on the stage. Booth landed off balance and went down on one knee, but instantly rose back up, shouting the Virginia State motto, Sic Semper Tyrannis. He ran across the stage heading to the actor's first entrance. Just before he reached it, Ferguson said Booth momentarily stopped, looked up, and said, I have done it, as he shook the knife. He then continued through the first entrance and went out of view. After making a statement at the local police station just down the street, Ferguson eventually wound up at the Peterson House, where the president had been taken. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton had set up shop in the rear parlor of the boarding house and had two judges and an attorney taking testimony from a total of six people, one of whom was Ferguson. Ferguson would also give accounts of the assassination to newspapers and, in May, appeared as a witness at the conspirators' trial at the Washington Arsenal compound. The lives of Ferguson and his immediate family would change forever in the coming year after the assassination. In December 1866, the Washington Evening Star printed the following account. About a year earlier, Ferguson had sent his 37-year-old wife Martha to stay with his friends back in Ohio, reportedly for her health. After several months, she said that he had stopped writing. And then word got back to her that her husband and Ella were living as man and wife. Martha traveled back to Washington and, failing to locate Ferguson, went to the house where Ella lived with her mother. Failing to find Ferguson there, in her rage, she took a canary that Ferguson had given Ella and wrung its head off. A fight broke out between Martha and Ella, and Martha pulled out a revolver and tried to shoot Ella, but the gun failed to fire. Others intervened, the police were sent for, and Martha was arrested. Bail was set at $1,000. It's unclear what happened to Martha after that. In 1867, Ferguson filed for divorce from Martha, but she could not be found. So evidently, she still wasn't in jail at that point. Divorce was granted by default in February 1868. Fifteen days later, 39-year-old Ferguson, married Ella, was less than half his age. The 1870 census records the Fergusons as still living in Washington with their young son, James Jr., but by the mid-1870s, they had relocated to Chillicothe, Ohio. They had another son, Robert, sometimes listed as Delos, and a daughter named Nellie. By 1888, after apparently spending some time in Iowa, 
The Fergusons had moved to Cincinnati, accepting James Jr., who was in Hillsboro, Ohio, operating his father's inn. In July 1890, the Fergusons' final child, John, was born. The following year of 1891 would result in tragedy for the Fergusons, as daughter Nellie died on June 13th of typhoid fever, and son John would die 15 days later of cholera, just before his first birthday. In 1892, while working at Hunt's Cafe in Cincinnati, Ferguson mentioned to a local reporter that he had been a witness to the Lincoln assassination, which resulted in a lengthy article about him being published, along with this drawing of him. Unfortunately, no images at all can be found for Ella or their children. On October 31, 1897, heart disease brought James Ferguson's life to an end. He was buried in this plot at Spring Grove Cemetery, not far from the graves of John and Nellie. If there ever was a marker, it's gone now. Ella and her two surviving sons continued to live in Cincinnati until the fateful year of 1903, when more tragedy would occur. On April 20th of that year, her son Robert, a married druggist, died. Just weeks later, her last surviving child, eldest son James Jr., died on June 3rd after a fall while trying to board a streetcar. Ella was now the only one left in her immediate family. She continued to live in Cincinnati, making her way as best as she could. The 1920 census lists her as working as a servant, apparently living with the family she served. On December 31, 1936, 33 years after the death of her last surviving child, Ella died at the Cincinnati widow and old man's home of what was listed as chronic myocarditis. She was also buried at Spring Grove Cemetery, though unfortunately not even in the same section of the cemetery as her husband. Hopefully in death, she found the peace that had so often eluded her in life. In the next installment, we'll look at two Michigan men who played a role in executing the Lincoln conspirators. Thanks for watching, and see you then.